I'm Mark Golub. And before we turn to the news, I want to take a moment to thank Ron Jacobson and Micah Halpern for so ably sitting in for me while I was on vacation with my family. And I'm happy to say you may see more of them in the coming weeks as I'll be preparing for the Jewish High Holidays in a little while. So thank you, Ron, and thank you, Micah. Also, I want to draw your attention to a fabulous piece written in Tablet, the online Jewish magazine, which I hope all of you look at on a regular basis. But there's a piece in Tablet right now written by Maddie Friedman entitled, An Insider's Guide to the Most Important Story on Earth. And Maddie Friedman is a veteran news correspondent. He's also an Israeli. And he writes this piece subtitled, a former AP correspondent explains how and why reporters get Israel so wrong and why it matters. And if you've read one article, if you're going to read one article on the Israeli Hamas war in Gaza, read Maddie Friedman's piece in Tablet, An Insider's Guide to the Most Important Story on Earth. It's an eye opening, revelatory article that puts so much of the anti Israel bias in the media into perspective. And may, all, and may also answer many of the questions you may have about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how it is so horribly mangled in the world media. It's a great piece, and I hope to have Matty Friedman on Shalom TV in the near future. But take a look at Matty Friedman's article in Tablet. But in the news today is a piece published recently in the New York Times by a vicious anti-Semitic group of anti-Zionists that's caused a good deal of consternation among well-meaning American Jews and Americans in general. And who is this group that put this piece in the New York Times? It's a group of Holocaust survivors, second and third generation, friends of survivors, who accuse Elie Wiesel of using the Holocaust unfairly and also accuses Israel of genocide against the Palestinians that evoke memories of the Holocaust as well. This group describes themselves as Jewish survivors and descendants of survivors and victims of Nazi genocide. And again, the piece attacks Elie Wiesel. Why does it attack Elie Wiesel? because Eli dared to publish his own opinion piece, saying that the Jewish people have put an end to child sacrifice some 3,000 years ago, and that now, as far as Eli Wiesel is concerned, Hamas should stop sacrificing its children in their war against Israel. For this, Eli Wiesel is attacked. And I have to tell you that I'm somewhat reluctant to even elevate this piece to a level of importance that it should be a subject of in the news. And you should know that we try very hard here at Shalom TV to avoid tabloid type material. I know how other television channels operate. I even know how other Jewish media organs sometimes use tabloid type stories to sell newspapers and magazines and to drive online viewership. It's simply not what we try to do. Unless a story has real legitimacy, I don't want to feature it on Shalom TV. So there's some truly frightening anti-Semitism spreading through Eastern and Western Europe today. That to me is a real story. There are, on the other hand, very occasional anti-Semitic incidents in the United States. They do not represent any significant trend or movement in the United States and they should not be reported as if they do or as if they are a real threat to American Jews. So you may see these stories reported on our Shalom TV update, but we're not going to make them into something they're not. And I feel a little bit about this, uh, I feel a little bit the same way about this story. The ad is placed by haters of Israel. And part of me says, you know, they're on the far, far left fringe. They do not speak for anyone but themselves. They certainly have no interest in dialoguing with anyone who disagrees with their skewed view of Israel. Why pay attention to them at all? But the problem is, Jews see this ad. Good people see this ad. 
and become very, very upset, especially when they see it's been written or placed by Holocaust survivors. And so people have asked me to respond to it. And so we are, which is why I'm so very pleased to have on our phones right now a woman who's paid a great deal of attention to the rise of anti-Semitism, to the anti-Israel hatred. She's also one of the most brilliant psychologists, writers, and feminists on the American scene. And she's the author of a riveting account of her own early marriage to an Arab prince in her award-winning book, An American Bride in Kabul, Phyllis Chesler, who also happens to be a fellow at the Middle East Forum. And Phyllis, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Phyllis, you wrote a superb piece as a response to this, again, paid ad published in the New York Times, which went after Elie Wiesel. I first want you to talk about your personal reaction to it and what prompted you to write a piece. And you heard my intro, and believe me, Phyllis, I, I'm so glad you're here to talk about it, because if someone's going to talk about it, I want it to be you, and I believe it deserves attention. But I want to know your personal reaction as you first read the story and why you were moved to respond to it. I was both sickened, saddened, and outraged. And, you know, this is nothing new, unfortunately, because the, the signatories are professors, intellectuals, authors, activists, feminists, leftists who believe that they are the good people. And so, for example, I was already fielding on July 31st, there's another group, Historians Against War, but they're really against Israel's survival. So they wrote a letter condemning Israel and defending Hamas, which is crazy. And again, some of the same signatories overlap. There, there are networks in place. Then on August 1st, Elie Wiesel, by the way, had to pay an enormous amount of money to have this view appear in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, in the Washington Post, in the LA Times, and his paid ad was rejected by the Times of London. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, what he says is MS. I mean, Abraham was taught by God, you don't kill your kids. Right. But Hamas didn't seem to learn that from the Torah. They are, as we all know, using not just children, but their civilians as hostages in a bid, in a propaganda war, in the hope that the international community will then not only demonize Israel, but stay Israel's hand as it attempts to clean out the terror tunnels and the massive arsenals that are in mosques and children and schools, including UNRWA schools, um, and in private homes. So Wiesel calls on Obama, President Obama and world leaders to condemn the use of children as human shields. And I add civilians as human shields. So on August 23rd, a paid ad appears in my hometown paper, the New York Times, ostensibly by the Jewish survivors and the descendants of survivors which means, and indeed, Mondo Weiss attacked Wiesel for playing the Holocaust trump card. And these people, likewise, are playing what they feel is their yichis, their Holocaust mm -hmm, trump card. Mm -hmm. But who are they really? Some, in one instance, a spouse of, of, a, of a hidden child. In other instances, vaguely relatives of survivors or relatives of victims or relatives of hidden children. I mean, this is very at a remove. I mean, the Jewish people are all relatives, if you will, of those who perished in the Nazi camps. So what is this group teaching our children and having themselves been taught by similar professors? What are they saying? They're saying Israel is committing a genocide, totally mm -hmm. a blood libel. Israel is racially dehumanizing Palestinians, a complete blood libel. Israel has 1.4 to 1.5 million Arab 
Palestinian Israeli citizens living in Israel proper. It's falsely accusing Israel of massacres. Now, you bring up that excellent article by Maddie Friedman, and let me suggest that everyone should also read Richard Bahar in Forbes, who followed what appears in the New York Times and how it then gets sloppily repeated elsewhere, all false, and he also explains why. So the media refuses to admit that Hamas is really like ISIS. Hamas is like Hezbollah. Hamas is like Boko Haram. Hamas is like Al-Qaeda. They still insist, the paradigm in place is still that Israel is the Nazi genocidal um, imperialist colonialist mm. band yes. and accuses Israel of crimes that Israel did not commit, never committed, never praises Israel for the pinpoint strikes with exquisite care attempting to avoid civilian casualties, but rather blame. Now, here's where it gets psychologically interesting. Israel gets blamed for all the crimes and sins committed by Hamas. And for that matter, how convenient to divert the entire world's attention away from the Muslim on Muslim, Muslim on Christian, barbaric violence going on right now in the Middle East, all over the Middle East. So there are more reporters covering Israel, Israel slash Palestine, a country that never existed, but which is treated with enormous reverence as a concept, you know, an ideal. It, it doesn't cover Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Somalia, Sudan, anyway, the, the Syrian refugees are a huge problem. The persecution of Christians in the Muslim world, but particularly right now in Iraq, and of the Kurds, it doesn't matter. One thing matters only. If an Israeli Jew kills a Muslim in combat, in self-defense, that's front mm -hmm, page. Mm -hmm. Why is, why is that, Phyllis? Why does that somehow rise to a level of, uh, of importance within the journalistic community where all of the litany of other horrors that are occurring right now in this world, they get very, very little attention? Why is it? Well, first, it's, uh, uh, guess what? Uh, the media doesn't really care about Arabs and Muslims when they're victimized by other Arabs and Muslims. They don't care about all of the crimes committed against Muslim women by Muslim tribal and religious, you know, on a crime cultures. So, but they would like to think they do. They don't. Mm -hmm. So what they can, and, and let me say something else. These intellectuals, th this intelligentsia in the West, they are the real suicide killers. In Gaza, I'm taught, I will only describe these people as human homicide bombs because suicide evokes some compassion, their suffering. But the suicide artists in the West are destroying the West from within and are making a common cause with Islamist barbarians who by the way are terribly misogynist and all of the women and gay women and men who signed both the historians against war letter and this latest group which is it hid its name by the way what and was I, its name what is its name the name is the international jewish anti-zionist network yes i jan that's who they are they yes. have a Position. They do not want Israel to exist yes. in any form. Uh, but they're standing on the so-called high ground of their Holocaust, uh, ye, you know, merit uh, in order to... But, but, it, but they did not reveal this in the ad in the New York Times. So I view them at best as heavily indoctrinated ideologues 
who do not care about fact or truth, have absolutely no concept of nuance when it comes to Israel and the Jews. They may have it in other areas. They have actually not much uh, expertise about the Middle East either. Mm -hmm. So th they, their imaginations are inflamed and they're being so well rewarded and honored for such politically correct views and they're blinded by groupthink and by peer pressure. They no longer can think as independent thinkers. And they believe that such a letter is an act of courage as opposed to a cowardly declaration of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. hatred. They really believe that th these are uh, courageous acts, that they're standing against the so-called Zionist elders of Zion conspiracy. That's what they really believe. And I mean, of course, you and I can talk about the imperfections in Israel. It is not uh, post-Messianic, but compared to the neighborhood in which it exists, compared to most of the world, Israel is a spectacular, yes. uh, ethical, noble country. And this is totally lost on these, I have to say, the, this is similar to American communists who kept insisting that Soviet Russia was on the right path and that if you had to kill a, a couple of hundred million people to achieve the ultimate noble goal of equality for all, well, then so be it. And they are the types that have never apologized for misunderstanding, as Emma Goldman quickly understood, misunderstanding the nature of Stalin. And they're similarly misunderstanding the nature of Hamas and all of the other, and Iran back, let's not forget Hezbollah, I didn't mention them before. Um, they are almost, you know Freud, he had a concept of Eros and Thanatos, uh, a life force and a death force. Yes. They seem to be hypnotized by a death-eating force. They are making a common alliance and creating a perfect storm, by the way, for Israel and the Jews between bloodthirsty barbarians who wish only to kill and die and these very privileged, educated Westerners who are destroying Western civilization from within without realizing that they're going to be very shortly, if they're lucky, um, in burkas and if, if they're women and they will be genitally mutilated and if they're gay men, they will be executed. And if they're children, they will be forcibly married in childhood and into polygamous unions and so on. So I, who understand and think all the time it's like trying to understand evil. At some level, it's incomprehensible. Okay. By the way, Phyllis, it's so interesting to hear you analyze, give us this analysis because, you know, there may be people who are saying to themselves, gee, Phyllis Chesler, at one point, weren't you a liberal part, you know, the, the liberal intelligentsia uh, community? That was your community. And why do you think, you know, in some way, it went astray, awry. Ah, that was my community. And I'd say I was uh, vaguely a leftist, but I was a civil rights uh, person in the 60s and then an anti-Vietnam War person. But then I became mainly a feminist leader. And uh, that was my contribution to humanity. Okay. Until I began to see, early on, I began to see the rise of anti-Semitism yes. in the early 1970s, which is what sent me to Israel, and I've then done many things on behalf of the truth since then. I, I think it was the Intifada, the Al-Aqsa Intifada of 2000, when I saw all the talking heads show the lynching of those two reservists in Ramallah over and over again with no pity and without naming it as a lynching. And then I knew that the bloody beast was back 
and that I had to do something. I had to stand up and say something at this historical moment. Good for you. And then, then 9-11 happens. And if you read what bin Laden said, I mean, this is, he was after both the, the Christian crusaders, America, the infidels, and the Zionism, and the Zionist Jews. So this is what he said. This is what he was doing. So I thought, okay. And then I discovered that many of my friends and allies didn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. They, even after 9-11, they thought, well, you know, these are freedom fighters who've been colonized and oppressed, and maybe it's not the right thing to do, but none of us are innocent because we've supported uh, an American government that's the worst government on earth, and we've supported Israel, the worst country next to America on earth, so we're also guilty. Mea culpa, plus these people, uh, my allies in the past, believe that slavery was so abominable a crime that they don't realize that America abolished slavery after a very bloody war, and they have no clue that Islam still practices slavery, yeah. always has Muslims in Africa, sold Muslims in Africa into the slave trade, into the New World, and they have no idea, or they're afraid to focus on the fact that Islamic history is also one of imperialism and colonialism and apartheid, gender and religious apartheid, mm -hmm. which is still true today. So they were primed, and I was among them, to uplift the oppressed, the wretched of the earth. Uh, and in a way, the Jews have an ethical commandment, you know, towards the stranger in the gate and et cetera. But something went wrong and I think Edward Said's false work, lying work, then allowed the Academy to become an anti-American, anti-imperialist, but especially pro-Palestinian and Said was a Christian, which is interesting. He was a dimmy and he was arguing the case for a country that never existed where he did not grow up, and yet uh, people forgot all about other oppressed folks, including women globally, and I'm including many feminists who forgot, and they said, oh, the most oppressed of all are the men of color who've been formerly colonized and now are captives of evil Zionism, worse mm. than Nazism. Yes. That's what happened. Okay. Phyllis... You know, you're not likely to change any of the minds of the people who put that ad in the New York Times attacking Elie Wiesel. What do you hope to achieve? What would you like to achieve? Why would you spend your time writing a piece in response when you know you're not going to affect the people who wrote it? What was your point in it? Okay, first, one must tell the truth and stand up for what is right and combat the big lies at every opportunity. Now, I agree with you, it's better to preempt the big lies than to have to analyze them after the fact. I also think that bit by bit, there are more and more intellectuals, some quiet and some uh, really running websites that are so glorious and so wise and truth-telling that we're giving physic, we're giving strength to Israelis first, we're giving strength to Jews who get it second, and that's really important because that influence may spread. Now, whether one can overcome ideology or brainwashing is a real question. I think we have to defeat Hamas totally, and then we might deprogram and negotiate with the civilians who've been held hostage by Hamas. So these ideologues who, uh, you know, I might, and I know many of them, that's so sorrowful for me. And I'm now feeling somewhat dirtied by my past affection and alliance with people who've turned out to be 
totalitarian fascists and Jew haters. And that's why I say I don't utterly, completely comprehend it. Communism can't possibly hold this much sway, but apparently it does. Uh, I think perhaps I may be able to get more and more ideologues to hear me. In fact, I know that this is true because I'm now being included in certain conversations. Wonderful. By such I ideologues. I understand. That's wonderful. One more question for you, Phyllis. There are people who have seen the ad. It looks like it's placed by Holocaust survivors. Yeah. And that it's as if Holocaust survivors are being critical of Israel in a vicious, vicious way. And I've had very well-meaning Jews say to me, this is horrific. Uh, it is the worst thing to read. And it, it's terrible if survivors now are turning on Israel. What would you want? Jews who have seen this, who are so upset by this ad, what's the bottom line for you? What would you like them to understand? Well, these are not, there are very few real survivors. Perhaps there are some children who were on kinder transports and or children who survived and got out. I think that is true. There, there's, Hetty Epstein is 90 and she's a survivor and anti-Zionist, but I don't think she... And she may have signed this. I'm not sure. She, she signs everything. Uh, these are people who, who will use anything that presents them as victims of Allah so that their word, uh, which is revealed from Sinai for them, this secularism, this socialism, this communism, is to them, uh, they're fundamentalists. And they're not independent thinkers. They're not true survivors of the Holocaust. I understand. But what can you say that would make a Jew who reads this feel better? What would you say to them? How do you feel I better? Feel better? Yes. I think we have to fight back. And it doesn't matter how we feel. Mm -hmm. What matters is the struggle we are commanded in each generation to take up the work of fighting evil and bringing light unto the nations. And those who lie, those who are against the truth, are blinding us and leading to no peace on earth. Phyllis, you continue to help us see the light and the truth. You know how much I appreciate you and love you. And it's wonderful that you would spend some time with us here on Shalom TV. Phyllis, don't ever give up or stop the fight, oh, okay? Well, you too. Together we'll do it, Phyllis. Thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Phyllis Chesler, a fellow at the Middle East Forum and author of An American Bride in Kabul. Again, I think she says it so well, and all one can do is understand that there are people on the far, far, far edge of the Jewish world and really in some way the civilized world, who are going to make Israel out to be the bad guy and disregard all of the facts. And it's good to have Phyllis here to kind of put it all in perspective for us. My thanks on this edition of In the News to Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, Dara Golub, our producer Carol Lilienthal, and to all the people here at Shalom TV who make this program and every program possible. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.